9 and 10 epilogue. Each Fazbear Fright story comes with an extra one thrown in there for good measure, like three normal stories and then the part of a bigger one that's expanding over all seven books in the series. These epilogues are the stories, and yes, they explain everything about the Stitch Wraith, or at least some of it. It starts in Into the Pit and continues on to the other books. They don't necessarily go in order, but the gist of these stories so far is the creation of the Stitch Wraith and then its mission to gather body parts. As it does in To Be Beautiful, when Baby hacks apart a girl in order to steal her identity, we don't really know what it's planning yet, but we can assume it's nothing good, because like, you know, it's FNAF. And at night, not entered. At first, based on the description of a white mask and such, we thought that the Stitch Wraith had to be entered. The combination of the Funtime animatronics as well as Baby and Ballora. But after seeing the creation in the epilogue of 1.35am, we now know indeed that it's not entered, even though it claims to look fairly similar. But this brings up an interesting idea. Why do they look so similar? I'm gonna move off the whole facts thing for a second and get into a little speculation. Why are the two characters so similar, at least when described? Perhaps Phineas knew about Ennard and got inspired by its appearance, or if the Stitch Wraith came first, I guess it could be that Ennard got inspiration from the Stitch Wraith? Or maybe rumors or stories William told? I don't know, okay? It calls for a lot of weird jumping, and it's very weird until we know more about the timeline of the games and the books and how they work together and like, you know. It's weird, but it's not entered. There's your facts. And at eight, agony beyond power of speech. The stories of the Stitch Wraith actually help us to understand how animatronics get possessed on a better level. At first, we just thought it was the normal way that possession works. Is there a normal way? Well, we just thought, you know, kid gets killed, kid gets put in the suit, and then kid possesses that suit because, yeah. But now, we know that they're actually possessed by Agony. According to Phineas, the creator of the Stitch Wraith, Agony is the most intense human emotion, and it reaches out further than any other emotion. And that it's used by the animatronics because, you know, they were killed as children in their favorite pizza joint by a golden bonnie. So Agony is a pretty reasonable feeling. The way we understand Remnant and how it works will help us understand more mysteries in the long run, and knowing about how Phineas was experimenting with human emotion just puts us one step closer to solving the entirety of FNAF. At least if Scott doesn't keep adding more mysteries. We know he will. Too much money. <laughs> Making bank! Oh man, I wish I had something as profitable as this. And at 7, The Missing Link. There have been so many additional mysteries that were added in the Fazbear Frights books, but they're all actually connected. And the reason we know that they're all connected is because of the Stitch Wraith. The Stitch Wraith is literally the link connecting a whole load of the stories together. And not just from the new books, but the original trilogy as well as the games can all be tied back to the Stitch Wraith. He was made with a battery from Fetch, his creator was looking for an Ella doll from To Be Beautiful that was made by Henry. He is the missing link in all the continuity of these stories, and whatever comes next I'm sure we'll learn more about him. I mean, there is a little bit of him in every body. Wait. And it's six key player. Like I said, each of the Fazbear Frights books has an epilogue chapter that tells a story about the Stitch Wraith. But what I didn't mention is the fact that the Stitch Wraith itself is actually a plot point in many of these stories. For example, in To Be Beautiful, Baby ends up cutting a girl into like chunks or like something like that she just dismembers like robotic body parts or something, you know, like limbs and stuff. And then those body parts are collected by the Stitch Wraith. In Fetch, the battery used to operate the Fetch dolls also gets used to power the Stitch Wraith. And the creator of the Stitch Wraith, Phineas, was looking for an Ella doll that appeared in the story about the girl who had a divorce and never got the family she wanted and eventually died in a vent. I don't remember the name of that one, but like, the Stitch Wraith is omnipresent in the Fazbear Frights books, similarly to how Thanos was in the MCU Infinity Saga, since he was behind the attack on New York in the first Avengers movie, and like he was like, manipulating things from the background. It's like how the Stitch Wraith is manipulating situations to end in its favor, at least that's what it looks like to me. 1.35am, that's the story. Yes, that's it, 1.35am. Halfway through at number 5, born this way. My mama told me when I was young, don't kill your creator. Well, obviously, the Stitch Wraith never got that lesson, probably because he didn't have the time. After being created, the Stitch Wraith immediately decides to off Phineas, which makes me think of this as potentially a symbol for Henry. We know that Henry died via an animatronic thanks to FNAF World, but the similarities between the two stories are strong, and while yes, we don't know much about this creature's origins, it could be a hint to what's coming next. People say that nobody is born evil, but they've obviously never heard of a bloodthirsty murder bot who instantly kills their creator. Or an antichrist. Hi. 
It had four appearance. The appearance of the Stitch Wraith was a point of confusion in the past. Described as a mysterious figure in a black cloak, with a white mask and features drawn on in black marker. One eye blacked out, a big toothy grin with blood around the mouth, who's staggering and limps while walking. That made everyone, or at least me, think of Ennard, who shows similar character traits. Aside from the whole lives in a dark cloak thing, but to be fair, anyone can grab one. Especially with the affordable prices of today's sponsor, I'm just kidding. Although, Cloak did release FNAF merch. And they didn't call me... So I'm kind of insulted. I mean, like, I'm reppin', you know. <laughs> Cloak hit me up. But the creepy appearance has made him be compared to Ennard, which would just be interesting. But it would mean that, like, Ennard didn't create himself, and that he wasn't actually a combination of the sister location animatronics, and, like, it's, it's not true. But this is because of, in 3, his origins. The origin of the Stitch Wraith is outlined fairly simply in the third Fazbear Frights book, 1.35am. At least, I think it's that one. No matter, we get to learn the whole origin of the Stitch Wraith, proving to us that this character is new and not someone we've seen before, like Ennard. Using the battery for Fetch and the agony from L, Dr. Phineas Taggart was experimenting with human emotion, saying that it emanates from us and soaks into our surroundings, claiming that agony is the most powerful and reaches out the furthest from us. And that agony is what really haunts objects and animatronics. The FNAF 1 or 2 era endoskeleton was found by Phineas and infused with the agony from the Ella doll. Then he puts a head on it from a 3 foot tall doll, which if you're looking for a visual, think like blank from Five Nights at Candy's. He adds a battery pack and turns it on. As he does, he gets killed instantly, potentially by accident, but nevertheless it happens and then the Stitch Wraith leaves under a black cloak. It's creepy, it's haunting, and it's extremely interesting, so I look forward to learning more. There's like three more books coming out or something like that? Three or four? Ish. And a two, potential identity. Now, we don't really know who the Stitch Wraith is. We don't know if we've seen the character already, but we can be pretty sure that we haven't. However, we can think about its potential identities for the Wraith. So, who could this be? Well, it could be the animatronic that kills Henry. I know, I know, but Baby was the one who killed Henry. Things change. And this could be the one who does it in another universe, or at least the endoskeleton was used for the animatronic that killed Henry. At least in the books, this endoskeleton is described as being unfinished unlike the scene from FNAF World where everyone thinks that it's Baby. This could be the way the Stitch Wraith gets tied back to the books, and this could be tied back to the games later on too. I mean, book number 5 is called Bunny Call, and it features a story about a man with gruesome burns all over his body, and an iron will to live. So, come on, I think we all know who that is. I always come back. Finally, in a number 1, Mystery. The scariest thing about this character is just how mysterious he really is. We don't know what he wants. Sure, we know how he was created, but that's the only thing. We don't know about his motives, we don't know about his goals, we don't know why he's collecting body parts, we don't know what he's planning on doing. And the unknown is probably the scariest thing in existence. You're scared of heights, that's because you don't know what you'll feel while falling. You're scared of being alone in the dark, well that's because you don't know what's hiding in the shadows. You're scared of that man who seems to be falling you because you don't know his motives or if he's really following you. The unknown is the root of all fears. Once you know something, it isn't as scary anymore. That's why they say face your fears to get over them, because once you understand it, you won't be as scared. You'll still potentially be scared, but you won't be as scared. But we know nothing about the Stitch Wraith, and that's why so far they're the scariest character of them all. Number 10, Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator. Lefty first appeared in the sixth game of the franchise, Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria Simulator. He is one of the few animatronics you find in the back alley and can salvage for spare parts. This doesn't sound so scary until you play FNAF 6 and realize just what salvaging entails, and you get to see this state the Lefty is in when you find him. Salvaging an animatronic for parts is usually done when that animatronic is no longer considered to be worthy of saving or repairing fully. So you can imagine just what kind of state the animatronics you find and can attempt to salvage from that back alley are in. Not good. Nightmarish. There's another aspect to your end of day routine. Number 9, Unknown Origins. When you find Lefty in the back alley, the Cassette Man voice recording will share that we do not know where this Lefty came from, as it does with all salvageable animatronics. So what was this messed up version of Lefty up to before it made its way to our establishment in Pizzeria Simulator? Well, Lefty is also an animatronic that you can find in the auction catalog, and has a rock star look to him, implying that he might have been an animatronic from another franchise location who maybe escaped. Also, if 
if you collect him and all of the Rockstar animatronics, you get an achievement for that, saying that you put the Rockstar ones together, so you can assume he's part of the Rockstar crew. Because his first appearance, however, was in FNAF 6, Pizzeria Simulator, much about his past beforehand remains pretty unknown. So much of it is still relegated to theories and speculation. Although we do get a pretty good, uh, pretty good little bit of intel in this game if you can find it. A little Easter egg in there. Number eight, Rockstar Freddy? Well, Lefty definitely has some Rockstar Freddy vibes going on, literally looking like a black and red version of Rockstar Freddy down to the shape of his body, he has some slight differences in his appearance. Namely, his nickname Lefty in part comes from the fact that he holds his microphone in his left hand, whereas Rockstar Freddy holds it in his right hand. As I stated previously as well, we don't know Lefty's origins, though it is believed that he was invented or at least modified by William's partner Henry, with the sole purpose of luring and capturing a certain animatronic within him. But which one? Will Amanda tell us more facts? Stay tuned to find out. Number seven, but first you'll need to lose an eye and an arm. Okay, so Lefty doesn't actually have any specific relation to Foxy, but I just like that song that Foxy sings, and I like Foxy, and I thought it was fitting, considering that Lefty does seem to be missing at least an eye, although he's still got an arm, so he's not quite a pirate yet. I'm not sure if it is because he got in a scrap with Foxy or if he wants to be a pirate or if he was perhaps just designed that way or just not kept in good working order. But his missing eye is pretty freaky, especially as the empty socket and eyelid are still very visible there. The only thing that would be more creepy in my opinion is if he managed to be missing both and still operate somehow. Something about an animatronic with their eyes just like gouged out staring deeply into my soul just really gives me those spooky feels. Number six, high risk, high reward. You'll notice as you acquire items and attractions in Pizzeria Simulator that there is a liability risk with certain items. If you find a lefty and manage to salvage him, you will earn a net profit of $5,000, which can obviously buy you lots of goodies from the catalogs for your pizzeria. However, if you simply want to acquire your own lefty for your restaurant, you can find him for purchase for $5 in the Rare Finds auction catalog. Yay, but also yikes. Lefty is a super high risk item, proving just how dangerous of an animatronic he is. He has a risk rating of 9, but he also has an entertainment value of 9. So high risk, high reward indeed. His liability risk rating gives you the impression that he increases your chance of a lawsuit, simply because he is one of the most likely animatronics, I guess, to attack and possibly kill customers or employees. And he'll also then be free to roam at night and potentially kill or torment you while you attempt to complete your nighttime tasks. Although really the worst case scenario there is if you try to salvage him and he escapes, then you don't get any money and lots of liability. Number five, aggressive. If you do choose to salvage Lefty when you find him in the back alley, be warned he can be aggressive. And if he gets too aggressive, he will jump scare you. You will live, but this will mean you miss out on that $5,000 reward you get for salvaging him and mean that he is now loose in your restaurant just waiting to attack you. Not ideal. Number four, mysterious. Lefty has an interesting personality when it comes to his behavior. He is very stealthy and creepily quiet, choosing to the players before he speaks. Even though you obviously weren't saying anything, why is he shushing? This makes his dialogue more creepy and just makes him a more frightening animatronic in general when compared to some of the others. Not just in Pizzeria Simulator, but also compared to other animatronic casts from previous games. Number three, actually it's left E. Lefty might seem like a cute name for an animatronic. It's catchy and seems pretty innocent, right? But Lefty's name isn't really that innocent when you look into it. Lefty is actually just a nickname for this shiny and fancy animatronic. His full name is actually a lot longer and doesn't have a Y at the end. Lefty is actually Left E with an E at the end. Or really, if we were saying it how it was spelt, Left, which is a lot less exciting and isn't actually a complete name for him. As I said, it's a lot longer than you think because Lefty is actually an acronym for Lure, Encapsulate, Fuse, Transport, and Extract. The acronym of course was used to create the nickname Lefty, which is much less suspicious and scary sounding. We find out the truth behind Lefty's name in the blueprints that can be found if you manage to unlock them on the computer in your office. 
Number two, the puppet within. While we don't know a ton about Lefty's backstory, something we do know is about the surprise inside of him. The surprise being another animatronic that we've become eerily familiar with since FNAF 2. The puppet. Possibly one of the most terrifying animatronics of all time. Let me know if you are also terrified of the puppet in the comments below. So yeah, with Lefty, it's like two animatronics for the price of one. The horrifying puppet and the super bone chilling whispery Lefty. Yikes. In fact, that is what Lefty's acronym of a name refers to, the fact that the puppet is encapsulated within it. Lefty appears to have been created to lure and capture the puppet so that Henry could ensure it would return to the pizzeria and he could finally free his daughter's soul trapped within it. Number 1. Music to Soothe the Savage Animatronic because Lefty is actually controlled by the puppet, who is in turn possessed by Charlie, Henry's daughter, it's unsurprising that we later learn in Ultimate Custom Night, where Lefty also appears, that music helps to calm this animatronic. Noise and heat agitate Lefty, but to avoid Lefty getting aggravated and jump scaring you, you can turn on the global music box. However, this will drain your power more quickly in Ultimate Custom Night, so it's usually not something you want to leave on all the time. However, this makes a lot of sense for Lefty to be soothed by the music box, which is what keeps the puppet from waking up in FNAF 2. I didn't have inspiration. The inspiration for Chica could be one of many things. One of Chucky's friends from the Chuck E. Cheese lineup called Helen Henny, which would make a lot of sense given the alliteration in Chica's name and the fact that they're chickens. Or it could have been thanks to Birdie the early bird from the original McDonald Land characters. Although it, if it was, her name would probably have been Chicken the Chicken because the, like, what Birdie the early bird is such a creative name. No wonder I've never heard about McDonald Land. Chica could also have gotten her name from the character of Chica from The Chica Show, an American kids show from 20. 12 that starred a chicken puppet named Chica. Based on the Chuck E. Cheese theme to the entire series, give or take a few murders, I'm gonna go with the inspiration being Helen Henny, but I could be wrong on that. In a 9 Ultimate Custom Night. Ultimate Custom Night helps provide a lot of scares for us, but also, thanks to various lines we get after we die, which happens a lot, we can learn multiple things from this game. Like how Chica still loves to bang around the kitchen, and I mean like me as a child and my grandparents using pots and pans as drums, since original Chica does this to announce her presence. It, it's just her gameplay mechanic. I did it because I thought it was cool. I was cool to my grandma. But we can also learn things from her death lines. Like no matter how badly Scott regrets FNAF World, he will still reference it with lines like You won't get tired of my voice, will you? And you won't get tired of dying, will you? You won't get tired of dying, will you? Another one being, where's my beak? Lodged in your forehead, of course. Where's my beak? Lodged in your forehead, of course. Suggesting that she is the one who caused the bite of 87, hence why the beak is removed. This also explains why Scott asked, why would Toy Chica be missing her beak during Matt Hutt's FNAF livestream where they discussed dream theory? I feel like he added this line so that we'd be like, oh. That's why. And it ate the Curse of Dreadbear. The Curse of Dreadbear loading screen is pretty sick. You're standing at this giant projector screen like a drive-in theater, then all of a sudden a bolt of lightning flashes behind it, revealing a giant Dreadbear standing over you. It's terrifying the first time you see it, and then there are other little Easter eggs in and around you, like Withered Bonnie and Withered Chica. But it's not really Withered Chica, it's actually the normal Chica model with the ch Withered Chica pose, making things look hella weird in this picture. The eyes are poking out the bottom of the mouth and the arms are bent backwards. I don't know why, but I'm getting like a real valley girl vibe from this pose. Like I saw this on Instagram way too much in high school kind of thing. Does anyone else see that or is it just me? And it's seven internet rule. There is a whole lot of weird out there on the internet. I'm part of it because I'm weird as hell, but I'm not even close to a good portion of it. With entire subreddits dedicated to the most famous internet rule of all, make sure you turn airplay off, there is bound to be some questionable fan art about your favorite FNAF characters. And while Foxy may be sticking their hook where it doesn't belong, or Ballora may be getting stuck in the washing machine, ever since the first game there has been a relentless amount of poultry themed visual poetry every time someone tries to edit a FNAF list and look for images. Sorry about this one, editor. However, you may want to back down from the casual furry Rule 34 drawings, since uh, thanks to Chica's yellow coloring, she is most likely a chick. And I don't mean like a chick like an old slang term for a female, I mean like a baby chicken. Yeah, a fully grown hen or chicken is usually white or brown, however, there is basically no fully grown chickens that are yellow, so yeah, there you go. 
and just saved your soul. And at six, Withered Glitch. Withered Chica is one of the most iconic Withered animatronics, probably because she's the most run down. Sure, Bonnie may be missing a face, but Chica has hanging wires and gashes all over. Withered Chica makes an appearance in FNAF 2 where she can enter your office and just stand there. You need to put your Freddy head on to get rid of her like any other animatronic that enters the office. And then your game will black out and she will be gone. There is a rare glitch, however, where Withered Chica is still in the office after the blackout after putting on the Freddy Fazbear head. If the player takes the head off, Withered Chica will either disappear, remain there until the monitor or Freddy head is raised and lowered, and which will result in a jump scare, or immediately kill the night guard as soon as the head is taken off. This glitch happens regardless of if the head was put on in time or not, and that's pretty freaking brutal. Like, is there a universe where Withered Chica doesn't give any sh** about what you try to pull? She'll just kill you for the hell of it. And like, it's kind of iconic. Halfway through at number 5, Long Scare. I've talked about this in the top 10 scary FNAF glitches, but Chica's FNAF 1 jump scare can actually be prolonged if you manage to flip the camera up in time before she's done screaming in your face. By doing this, the jump scare resets and actually helps you stay alive longer. Doing this enough times can actually win you the night if you keep it up longer than my grandpa can. Thanks, Grandma, didn't need to hear that one. If you repeat this over and over, time does actually pass, and as long as you don't get the dreaded static, you're still alive. Which could honestly have some lore implications if we tried hard enough, but I don't think that's really what's important. The fact that Chica allows this to happen in a way just shows that she just wants to torment you, since we all know now that we play as Michael, who looks a lot like his father. So much so that even Baby, an animatronic possessed by his sister, thought that you were her dad at first, which is kinda weird. No, it's really weird. And at 4, Survival Logbook. The Survival Logbook, if you didn't know somehow, is a FNAF book that is full of different lore clues and is basically disguised as an activity book for a security guard known as Mike, who we all guess is Michael Afton. In this book, there are a few depictions of Chica. Page 23 has her chilling with Bonnie. On page 38, she's raging at a cherry computer, a stand-in for Apple because I guess they wouldn't pay for the placement. Page 48 has her as a drawing in the background, and page 53 has her looking kinda sus with the cupcake behind her back. Yellow looking sus to me. Page 64 is the scariest of them all, having a picture of Chica dabbing. Ah, oh dear god, why? On page 86, she's pitted against Freddy in a who would win battle, and on page 96, she's seemingly baking another cupcake, or maybe some cookies. She's cooking something. And then on what would be page 112, the final page in the book, we see a picture of a different form of withered Chica. This is one of the biggest mysteries to me, like why is a new withered Chica on the final page of the book? I used the black light on every single page and there was nothing. I plan on scanning it and putting it into Photoshop to see if I can find anything, but it's so weird to me. Like, we see Chica seven other times in this book, but she's important enough to be the last thing we see. And at three, groaning. In FNAF 1, whenever Bonnie and Chica get close to the office, we can hear some weird sort of groaning or moaning coming from the animatronics. Some have theorized that this is just their music box malfunctioning, since we know they have one thanks to FNAF ER's parts and service minigame, and I'm sure it was mentioned beforehand. However, even damaged, I'm sure there is no way they would make such a gutterly realistic sound. This is probably caused by, you guessed it, the children stuffed inside the animatronics. Susie's groaning can be heard in the very first game. Ho. Oh. Now look, I love me a good stuffed bird for Thanksgiving dinner, but this is a little too much, alright? I'll stick with my tur turkey key, and you can have the chicken stuffed with literal human kid. Why do they have to groan? Come on, Scott, why'd you do this to me? Why? <laughs> Penultimately, in a number two, glitches. There seems to be quite a few errors with Chica over the various games. Glitches are an inevitability when it comes to games. We all know this thanks to Skyrim and Cyberpunk 2077, but some of these Chica glitches are just weird. In some areas, of the first game, for example, Chica can have a back bib. It will literally just end up behind her. Maybe because who needs a bib when you have pizza? And the prolonged jump scare glitch I mentioned earlier. Chica can also be seen missing an eye when she and Freddy are on the stage alone together. Ho oh, ho, something's cooking. And sometimes she's missing both eyes in the cutscenes from FNAF 2. In FNAF 2's parts and service room, her endoskeleton neck is incorrectly placed. And there is a big hole inside of her body, even though you can't see it from the outside. Finally, in a number one, First! <laughs> it's like the comments section. I mentioned earlier that Chica has plenty of voice lines in FNAF Ultimate Custom Night. One of which, and probably the most important one being, I was the first. I've seen everything coming from Withered Chica. I was the first. I have seen everything. 
suggesting that Susie, the girl we think was stuffed into Chica, was in fact the first victim, and not Charlotte like we all originally thought. Although she could have just been the first of the missing children, since we see the puppet give them life in the FNAF 2 minigame. Plus, in the demo troll version of Ultimate Custom Night, there is a scene where Freddy says to Chica, Hey Chica, you have lore significance now, which is just kind of rude. But true. This also would explain why Chica was the first, or one of the first to get a Jacko version. Since Jacko Chica says, I am a burning reminder of your misdeeds. Since she would have been the first, it would make sense that she's the one that he would regret the most. And by that logic, I think that Bonnie might have been the second, followed by Foxy, since they're the ones who also got Jacko or Burning versions. Number 10, Fun Time Lolbit. Lolbit is obviously a variation on another female version of the animatronic. We are talking here about Fun Time Foxy, where Fun Time Foxy is pink and white in terms of coloring. Lolbit instead is orange and white with purple accents. Lolbit's bow tie and cheeks are purple as well as their lipstick. Lolbit basically is like a bolder version of Fun Time Foxy. At at least in terms of her color scheme. Number 9, LOL. L O L. In Ultimate Custom Night and Sister Locations Custom Night, Lolbit can appear as an obstacle. If Lolbit pops up on the computer screen, you must type L O L quickly into your keyboard or tap the keyboard if you're playing on mobile. Voiding to do so will result in you losing all control and visuals as Lolbit's standby screen will appear for a short while. If, however, you respond quickly enough, Lolbit will simply disappear, leaving you alone. And friends, before we move on to this next point, if you are loving this list and you need more FNAF lists, let us know in the comments and give this video a thumbs up. Remember, every time you give one of our videos about FNAF a thumbs up, an animatronic gets their wings. Don't you want animatronics to have wings and fly around? Be even more terrifying for us. Number 8, Missing Eyebrows. A difference between the two sister animatronics is that Lil Bit seems to be completely missing their eyebrows. It must be hard being Lil Bit. I feel like you'd have very few ways to express yourself without eyebrows. It's unknown what happened to Lil Bit's eyebrows if they ever existed, though I think it's safe to assume because they're an animatronic that they were probably just designed without them. After all, they wouldn't be alone. Balloon Boy, Springtrap, Mangle, and Bonnie all don't have eyebrows either. But without eyebrows, what do you do if something wet is about to drip into your eyes? Oh well. Oh, well, wait a minute. Number seven, missing eyes. That's right, Lil Bit is not just missing eyebrows, but it's also missing their eyes. So I guess they don't have to worry about things dripping into their eyes. They don't really have them, in the conventional sense, at least. Which makes Lil Bit one of the creepiest alternate variations on the Foxy animatronic. Namely because while Foxy as a pirate might be missing an eye, Lil Bit is missing both eyes. Instead of eyes like Funtime Foxy, where Lil Bit should be, there are just two little pinpricks of bright white light. How Lil Bit lost her eyes, we don't know. It is possible, of course, that she was designed without them, like her eyebrows. Though I'm not sure which idea there is more terrifying. Did she lose her eyes? Or someone like, yeah, we're gonna make, we're gonna make this animatronic super creepy. Number six, mostly a floating head. While in FNAF world, Lulbit did have a whole body, almost every other depiction of the animatronic has excluded their lower half, making Lulbit mostly just a floating head. Unless we're talking about Help Wanted, but we're not talking about Help Wanted right now. They are often depicted as being without a body or an endoskeleton. Poor Lulbit, they have no body to call their own. I guess they left their body all the way back in FNAF world. Hopefully one day they'll be able to retrieve it. Don't worry, they will. And help wanted. Number five, sister location. The whole reason that people mostly think of Lulbit as a floating head, it's because when she shows up in sister location, that's exactly how she appears. Add in the fact that her customizable character appearance also shows her mainly as a floating head, and well, it all makes sense. In sister location's main game, Lulbit is no more than an easter egg. She appears as simply a recolored Funtime Foxy head, and is not seen as any real threat to the protagonist. Just a creepy head that's obviously meant as a nod to her appearance in FNAF World. Number four, Hook Hand. Lulbit also has a hook for a hand. Well, at least the version from FNAF World does. This is another feature that sets them apart from Funtime Foxy, but brings them closer in appearance to the original Foxy. For some reason, their big jolly appearance combined with this hook hand just makes them even more scary to look at than Foxy for me. And I mean, I say that, but Foxy initially already kind of has a, like a sinister energy due to their habit of sprinting and their kind of ramshackle appearance in FNAF 1. Something about how happy Lulbit is to be brandishing that hook that makes me feel super wary of them. It's always the ones you don't expect, you know? 
Number three, Help Wanted. Lulbit also appears in Help Wanted. Here, they have eyebrows, no hook hand, and a speaker, and a full body. Similar in appearance to Funtime Foxy, in fact, Funtime Foxy is also featured in the same version of the Dark Rooms minigame there. Here you must sneak through Funtime Auditorium and avoid not just Funtime Foxy, but also Lulbit. Lulbit not only has a complete body in this version, but they also get their own jump scare to show off once they catch the player in game. So you can check that out too. Number 2, FNAF World. Lulbit initially appeared in FNAF World and was later turned into a fun time variation of the character when she was added to the other FNAF games, initially as an easter egg and later appearing as an obstacle in Custom Nights as we discussed earlier, and then a full on antagonist in Help Wanted. In FNAF World she had her hook hand, which was swapped out for a full hand eventually in her full body fun time version. While this version from FNAF World still didn't have eyelids, eyeballs, or eyebrows, she did have eyelashes, making her look very creepily cute. Cutely creepy. Not sure which. Number one, all the variations. Since her initial introduction in FNAF World, there have been tons of little details that have been adjusted for Lulbit's design. The changes, however, are also more often so small that it can be kind of hard to tell which Lulbit exactly you're looking at. There's hook hand, no hook hand, eyebrows, no eyebrows, body, no body. Okay, so maybe a few of those differences are like a little bit bigger than I let on. I feel like body and no body. But for such few appearances, one thing is for certain. We have lots of variations of Lulbit. I cannot wait to see if she'll become a more prominent character in the games in the future and what else could possibly happen with her design. Here's hoping we see more Lulbit. In a ninth and first location. The first location of the Freddy's franchise was actually Fredbear's Family Diner. This was also something that was merely an assumption until this point, but for a while we considered the Fredbear's Family Diner to beat the first location, so at least we get some more timeline confirmations there. It's interesting though that Scott chose to confirm this particular location instead of something else that could have had more significance, which leads me to assume that there might be more to Fredbear's Family Diner than we first imagined, and that there might be more to take a look at here. The diner makes an appearance in FNAF 2 and 3 according to the wiki, although it appears that the Take Cake minigame does happen at the FNAF 2 location thanks to the security puppet minigame from FNAF 6, so maybe we should be taking a close and more intense look at the FNAF 3 minigames to see if there's anything else we can find. And at 8, the creator. The famous William Afton is the man responsible for the creation of the animatronics we all know and love. This is something that has actually been bugging me for a while, because while the books have William as a creator, we weren't sure if he was the creator or just a technician in the games. So with this line confirming William as a creator, we may be able to go back and fine tune some of our speculation with this new information. Since he is a creator, he probably would be the only one who knew how to deal with these animatronics, so the possibility of another technician is now lower than it was at first. Him hiding the bodies in the suits suddenly becomes more plausible as nobody would really understand how to open them, and the FNAF VR parts and service minigames become more telling, because while yes, they could have been made by the studio, the sheer complexity of them seems to indicate that William had a hand in instructing them on where to take the minigame. Perhaps this was truly how William had set up these animatronics to work, so nobody would be able to mess with this hiding spot. Cause I mean like, why would you press both sides of Bonnie's head? Like why would you pull on Freddy's bow to get his chest to open? It just doesn't make sense. And it's that Springlock suits. The original animatronics featured Springlock suits that had to be hand cranked to allow them to be worn safely by employees. This was something we already knew based on FNAF three minigames, but it's nice to get confirmation anyway. The original animatronic suits were spring lock suits that could be worn by employees in suit mode or put into robot mode to allow them to perform on stage. This also confirms that the item we see in Purple Guy's hand in FNAF 2 is in fact a spring lock crank like we've been assuming, although we did at first think that it was a phone. But now we have a better understanding, although this proposes another idea. If that was a spring lock crank, does that mean that the animatronics Purple Guy was disassembling in those minigames were actually spring lock suits? Because if that was was the case, we would have a whole other reason as to how the missing children died, because that would certainly be more agonizing than like a knife through the chest or something. And it's six, yummy pizza. 
The Fazbear's Twisted Pizza recipe was voted most yummy by 6 out of 10 children in every survey from 1988 to 1993. This gives us a bit more insight into the actual locations present within the FNAF universe. The existence of a Twisted Pizza also implies that this is what the Twisted animatronics were named after, and it actually makes some form of sense, at least to my twisted brain. Since if the pizza was voted the most yummy and the animatronics were meant to show you something that you wanted to see, I guess your eyes would also consider those animatronics to be the most yummy. Yummy. But this could also just be an indication as to the years the Twisted animatronics were operational, since we do get the years of 1988 to 1993, which seems to line up with the events of the books and the games. Since Scott is clever in hiding easter eggs and explanations, maybe this is what he had in mind when writing this fast fact. And at 5, first animatronics. Some of the first animatronics built by William Afton featured claw mechanisms that were able to hide away items inside them. This is one of the best fast facts we got, because thanks to this line, we know that William William intended on killing even before acquiring Fredbear's Family Diner, since that was the first location. And the only animatronics we see have a claw mechanism are the ones from Sister Location. Baby is the only one we actually see use the claw, but with containment chambers being present, we can assume the other fun times have them as well. Which means the fun times were made before they opened the first Freddy Fazbear's location. Hence why William was able to open Circus Baby so quickly when he learned that Fazbear's was going to close. Which means if not for Baby's line of being on stage for one day, we wouldn't really know when Sister Location takes place. Or at least we would have to question it. And if we're dangerous. In 1993, the most dangerous profession in the United States was actually a night security guard. This seems to just be a funny nod at how many people die in the Fazbear restaurants, because the actual most dangerous profession from 1993 in the US was, at least based on number of deaths per 100k employed, was fishers. But based on just sheer amount of deaths, it was operators, fabricators, and laborers, with nearly 2,000 deaths. So if night security guard was actually the most dangerous job, more than 1,959 security guards would have needed to die in the FNAF universe, which is incredible to say the least. However, if we're going off the number of deaths per 100,000 employed, over 159 security guards would have needed to die, which is a much more reasonable yet still shocking number. This is also not including the fact that the president is technically the deadliest job in the US since a high number have been assassinated. That's just an even higher percentage, but we don't we don't talk about that. <laughs> Getting close to the end in number 3, location confirmed. Despite the name, hurricanes are actually actually not the leading cause of death of children in Hurricane Utah. This is a more specific confirmation of the location that the game takes place in. Since Utah was the state that things had been narrowed down to thanks to the pay stubs we get in the games, but this just places it in Hurricane Utah. Now I don't think that there's much else to be learned from this. I don't think that like Scott pulled like a Gravity Falls with a real scavenger hunt that was planned or that was started in Hurricane, but I can't really rule it out because at this point we've jumped through hoops more than starving dolphins at SeaWorld to get lore, so a real life issue like a real life scavenger hunt like this would probably be in the cards, at least if Scott hadn't announced his retirement. But I think that since these fast facts were found in the game files and were unused, that means if there was an ARG or scavenger hunt planned, it's no longer in the works. Who knows though, maybe you'll find like a Woodland Freddy statue or something out in the woods. If, yeah, at least if it was started. Are there woods in Utah? I don't know. Can we get the king of random on this? Just go out looking. I'll join. And ultimately, in number two, Cupcake. Chica's Cupcake features a unique set of servos and its own independent suite of software. This is the fast fact that was the foundation of my explanation as to where a Shadow Chica would have gone. The fact that the Cupcake is its own separate animatronic means that it could be possessed separate to Chica. So if there was ever a reason for Shadow Chica, or if the Shadow animatronics are spirits that somehow got kicked out of their animatronics, Chica's Shadow could have just been hiding in the Cupcake. But the Cupcake being their own animatronic is also something we've already known since in FNAF VR's parts and service minigame, you see the cupcake jump off its plate and run around before you can catch it and put it back on the plate. The cupcake also got its own jump scare in FNAF 4, but that could have also just been Chica like holding it up or like throwing it at you, but I, I doubt it at this point. Finally, in number one, I wanna be a rock star. 
Man, Bonnie's playing Nickelback. Rockstar Bonnie was developed from the original Bonnie for use in Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria's franchise operations. This is something that is highly interesting, but not really of big consequence. The fact that Rockstar Bonnie is a development of original Bonnie indicates that maybe the original animatronics weren't melted down in the games. Sure, Candy Cadet speaks of five things becoming one thing, but maybe that wasn't referring to the fun times at all, since in the books, the fun times were created by melting down the endoskeletons of the original original 5 animatronics to make Remnant, which is the molten soul metal, but all the metals mixed together into one horrific mess, hence why they had to come together into Ennard. Also, we also got a confirmation that the fun times were the first animatronics that William made, so he wouldn't have made the other ones first, so therefore they wouldn't be possessed, at least in the game world. So if the Rockstar animatronics are the original animatronics just refurbished, maybe this isn't the case, and the FNAF 3 ending was accurate with the souls being put to rest, which would mean that Golden Freddy is at rest, meaning that the one you should not have killed couldn't be Cassidy. At least, that's how it seems to me. But this could also be a misinterpretation, and they just meant that it was designed to be like the original Bonnie instead of using the same parts. It's not specific enough, but it does actually sound like they are meant to be the same parts, or at least the endoskeleton is the same. And again, with the fun times being first, that means that like they couldn't be possessed by the original five. I mean, that's, that's how it's looking at this point, at least until Lumix says that these aren't canon, if they end up saying that they aren't canon. There we have it friends, the FNAF Fast Facts Explored. I know that it was only 9, but there are literally only 9 Fast Facts, so I can't really make up another one to make 10, that would be kind of bogus.